Hey, how's it going and welcome to another video. Alright, so not too long ago, I finished Persona 2 Eternal Punishment to kind of round out the sort of main numbered Persona games. And then I realized that there was one other uh, game in the series that happens to end with the number 2 that I never finished. The only mainline numbered SMT game that I never completed, that of course being Shin Megami Tensei 2. So I figured I'd knock another one off the old bucket list and spend the past couple of weeks just playing through SMT2. And yeah, it was, uh, interesting. <laughs> so for a little bit of background, I actually finished SMT1 many, many years ago. I played it on the old iOS port from way back in the day, which is no longer available. Like, that was the first and I think the last way to, to play that game officially in English. And it's no longer available, so yeah, like a, a re-release of that version would be really cool. But yeah, I played SMT1, and despite its flaws, I ended up really liking it. That game kind of has a sort of special place in my heart. Despite its age, I think it, there is definitely a solid and very unique experience in there. It's just unfortunately kind of stuck in the era that it came from, right? An SMT1 remake would actually go hard, but... Yeah, I had always intended to play SMT2. I think at one point I did make a couple of hours of progress into it a long time ago, but yeah, for one reason or another, I just never ended up finishing it. That is until yesterday, so I liked this game. Like, obviously, I, I sort of liked it enough to finish it, but I think it definitely comes with the caveat of its age and just like a lot of the sort of very, you know, old school RPG design decisions especially in terms of how you kind of progress through the game, sort of make this a kind of a hassle to play. And I think it's definitely the kind of game that you need to go into with a certain expectation that this game is old. It's like, it's sort of a little fucked up, but there is a lot to love about it. Although to be honest, I'm not sure how much, like the stuff that I enjoyed, how much it kind of won out in the end over the, the sort of irritation factor that it caused me. So to kind of talk about some stuff that I do like, first of all, I like the fact that this game out of like basically any of the, especially the mainline numbered games, feels the most like a sequel to the game that came before it. SMT2 is a direct follow-up to SMT1 and kind of shows you what happens in the decades following the ending of that game. And even though a lot of like, especially the setting and kind of lore of the game is built on what happened in the first game, almost everything else about it is pretty original. Everything ranging from the characters are pretty much all new. There's very, very few returning faces. This definitely doesn't feel like, here's Shin Megami Tensei, but again. Since even though it's definitely kind of, you know, it has a lot of the, the SMT1 DNA, especially in terms of like the gameplay and the exploration and recruiting demons and so on. It definitely has kind of its own identity and its own flavor going on. So I think that's pretty cool. And speaking of the gameplay, one thing that, that still kind of continues to surprise me is how solid the combat actually is despite the game's age. It's definitely not as intricate as like Nocturne, for example, because that was the first game that had press turn. But the combat is still pretty zippy. It's not like a lot of older games and even some of the, the games in the series that kind of came after SMT2 that feel sort of slow, right? No, all the animations and just like the speed of the text and everything feels like it goes by fast. You know, you don't spend a lot of time sitting there watching a fight go by and think like, oh my god, fucking go faster. So that's definitely something that kind of helps with the playability of the game. So yeah, the combat is definitely serviceable. Like a lot of the elements you're probably familiar with from later entries in the game, like buffs, for example, the different kind of elemental spells, recruiting demons, like all that stuff is there, but it's definitely not as intricate or as difficult for that matter. Like I think SMT though, like kind of the wider series didn't really develop that reputation for being like difficult until maybe Nocturne came around. Since with the exception of a couple of boss fights, this game, like in terms of especially the boss battles, was really not bad at all. And I would say the dungeons themselves are also not that big of a deal. Like, there's definitely a couple of sort of pain points throughout the game where you're like, oh my god, this place sucks. Another aspect I liked a lot that I'll probably, I'll have more to say when I kind of get to the spoiler section is like the story and the actual characters. They're both pretty solid, especially kind of like for the time. It's kind of hard for me to uh, talk about this story without just spoiling the whole thing. Like, I'm not sure how much people care that much because this game came out in 1994, but I definitely liked the cast of characters, but I feel like there was a lot more they could have kind of done with them. I think this is kind of just a, a byproduct of like the way the story is told. 
But there are a lot of characters in the game that I was really, really interested in that I thought were conceptually cool who, in the grand scheme of things, don't really do all that much, or you really don't learn very much about them. I think this is especially true for kind of like the main crew of people. Like one thing that's kind of cool about this game is most of the main characters you actually get to name yourself. I just stuck with their canon names because I'm boring, but... Depending on the character for some of these guys, you really spend like almost no time with them. And so I found myself in this situation where I wanted to like like a lot of these guys and kind of have more of an attachment to them, but I felt like in the end I didn't really. There was one character who's definitely a big standout for me. That of course being my dude Zayd, who might honestly be my favorite law character at this point. Like... That's not really a hard, like, thing to accomplish, considering there's not really a whole lot of law characters I'm all that into, but... Yeah, Zayn is awesome. Imagine, like, the most based law guy, who does believe in, like, the concept of order and striking down evil and stuff, but he's not okay with tyranny. And that's another thing that's sort of interesting and kind of unique about this game, is that this is for sure the law game. Like, Nocturne, for example, was kind of designed with chaos in mind, and SMT2 was designed with law in mind, so... Like, most of the characters that you encounter are law-aligned characters. This is kind of a game where the setting is essentially law has more or less won out. The entirety of Tokyo Millennium, where the game takes place, is under the rulership of law, and a lot of the kind of chaos factions are pushed out into just like the far corners of the world, essentially. So that's definitely something that makes the game stand out. And yeah, the actual setting itself is really cool. Like, essentially what happens in SMT1, the sort of final area of the game is called the Great Cathedral. And in the decades following kind of the end of SMT1, Law Gang basically took over and built the center, which is just this like massive artificial structure with all these different areas and just like a giant church in the center. So the actual setting is very cool and it feels really futuristic. Like this definitely feels like the most kind of sci-fi-y out of pretty much all the games in like especially the mainline series I'd say. Like you could definitely feel, yeah, this is taking place in the future. And I think like a remake of especially this setting would be so cool because this is conceptually so interesting but I feel like they're they were kind of just limited by the technology at the time and really weren't able to kind of present the setting as well as they maybe could have like I feel like SMT1 kind of has the same problem so yeah that's some of the stuff that I enjoyed like the actual combat and gameplay is still pretty fun the setting is very interesting I really like the theme of law being ever present throughout it however Actually making progress through this game can be kind of rough. This is a game that I struggle to imagine me ever completing without a walkthrough. Early on, it's not too bad. Like, the game does an alright job of kind of guiding you towards where you need to go, but the more the game opens up, the harder it gets. Since a lot of the time to make progress in the game, you'll have to, like, talk to NPCs that maybe you spoke to, like, a dozen hours ago who maybe mentioned something about, like... Like, I can imagine some poor little Japanese child back in the 90s playing through this game and just not having any idea where to go at certain points. Like, one of the big kind of hurdles you'll have to overcome to progress in the game is you need to attain these pillars. And the way you get the pillars kind of ranges from pretty sensible to absolutely incomprehensible. For example, one pillar is dropped by a boss that you have to defeat. Alright, cool, no way to miss that one, right? Another pillar is given to you by a random shopkeeper if you buy anything from him. Alright, kinda weird. At one point in the game, you're down in this factory and there's like a boss that's causing problems so you have to go down like fucking six floors to fight him. Then many, many hours later into the game, you have to go down to the same spot and like dig around where the boss was and that's how you find another one of the pillars. And then this one's my favorite, is uh, to get one of the pillars, there's like these disco parlors throughout the game. In order to get the moon pillar, you need to go to one of these places on a full moon and participate in a dance contest. And in order to win, you need to have 10 magic. The thing that's fucked up about this is that magic is a useless stat otherwise in SMT2. Like, your protagonist does not learn magic. So from a practical standpoint, putting any points into magic is a complete waste of time. So in order to get this pillar, you need to have dumped a couple of points into an otherwise useless stat. There are some ways to boost it up, like... 
There's certain equipment that you can get that'll boost up your magic a little bit, but you know, this is one of those kind of game design decisions that I sit there and I think, why why would they do that? You know? It's like it's it just feels so counterintuitive to make something that you need to progress through the game like only attainable by doing something dumb. And there's a lot of other just like random examples of this happening, like having to find just totally out of nowhere NPCs that happen to have a thing that you need to progress. There's just a lot of these like these irritation factors throughout the game that it make it so that I, I feel pretty confident in saying I don't think I'm ever gonna replay this game. Like this, this is not on the uh, priority list for games that I want to like re-experience. So like, yeah, a lot of this stuff I guess you could have figured out if you spent enough time just like wandering around, talking to random NPCs, going to sort of obscure places like revisiting rooms and shops and stuff that you've already been to, but. I don't know, part of it is just how, like, that's kind of just how RPGs used to be designed back in the day. You know, some of the intention behind some of these, like, really old JRPGs is that you were gonna buy it and it was gonna be like, this thing was a project, you know? This wasn't something that you were gonna clear over the course of a weekend or a week. This might be a game that you buy and you might get finished with it next year, maybe. So I can't really give it too much shit considering its age and how games were kind of designed back then, but yeah, it definitely made the actual playing experience of it like not all that fun. So that's definitely the biggest sore spot for me is the actual progression of the game. Yeah, I did not like a lot of the process of proceeding through it. All right, so I'm gonna get into some kind of spoilery stuff now. If you would prefer not to hear some of this stuff, then uh, this is where the video functionally ends. But to talk about kind of some of the standout moments of the playthrough for me. So I ended up actually getting the law route in this game. And surprisingly, this is the first time I've ever like uh, naturally gotten a law ending on my first playthrough of one of these games. You know, I'm usually Chaos Gang for life, but SMT2 feels the most like out of any of these games that it wants you to go law, which makes a lot of sense considering the game was designed with law in mind as its theme, but... Yeah, this game for sure feels like it's pushing you towards law and almost like away from the other routes. So you know how in pretty much all these games they'll have like the different little questions and choices and stuff that you can make that'll affect your alignment? It feels like in this game especially, a lot of the stuff that gives you law points is kind of just like stuff that makes you like a decent human being. You know, I feel like in like SMT4, for example, a question might be something like, a group of people are rioting and disrupting the peace. What should you do? And your options might be like, join in, ignore them or execute them all, right? And like execute them all would be like your law option. Whereas in this game, a lot of it is like, you see a homeless man on the street. You have infinite dollars. Will you give the man a dollar? It's like, yeah, I guess so. So it's like, oh man, you're a good servant of the Lord. Here's some law points for you. You know, you'll run into a lot of different NPCs throughout the game that have an item that you want that are like trying to sell it to you. You know, stuff that you need to progress and they might be like, if you give me 20,000 Mako for this thing, I'll give it to you. And if you just agree with them and give it to them, then that's law points. Whereas if you like fucking steal it from them, that's chaos points. So yeah, this game definitely feels like it kind of wants you to go law. And I think it definitely helps that kind of like the sort of main law representative Zayn, like I said, is hyper Omega based. You know, Zayn really is that dude. Like when he's first introduced, you kind of get the vibe that he's like, he's our typical law sort of guy, right? He's the kind of guy who's like, you know what? If you go against the laws, then you're a bad guy, but... He's more so about, like, maintaining peace than anything, I feel. You know, it kind of reaches a point where the guys that are running Millennium start to do some really evil, underhanded shit. And he basically starts his own little rebellion against them, which is pretty cool. And as it turns out, a uh, big, big spoiler warning, Zayn is in fact Satan. And it's like, it's weirdly really funny seeing Zayn or Satan just go on this fucking rampage, like judging anybody that he views to be evil, including God himself. You know, like you would expect from an SMT game, like things kind of get out of hand, right? It's like you start off the game and the, the conflict that's going on is like, oh man, there, there's a King Frost who's taken over Holy Town. You better go deal with him. And then you're sitting at the last moments of the game and you and Zayn are sitting on a fucking spaceship after having obliterated all life on the planet. And fucking God comes down and is like, well done, Satan and Aleph. And fucking Zayn is like, yeah, but there's one more person we need to judge. You, God. So, so awesome. So yeah, I'd say that was the thing about the story that I enjoyed the most was... I mean, essentially, Zayn was just, like, kind of seeing how his journey plays out and 
seeing him come to terms with the fact that the people running Millennium are actually evil as shit. But other than that kind of standout, honestly, I feel like a lot of the story is, is, is starting to kind of escape my memory at this point. Like, the game, I feel like its plot definitely suffers from a lot of distractions. I feel like a lot of that time could have been better spent on the actual, like, the main plot of the, the pretty classic Law versus Chaos that was going on. Since that stuff is really cool as per usual, but other than that, it was good. Like, I'd say I definitely liked ST1 kind of more overall. I feel like I was just more into that setting, the actual story that was going on but two is solid i think it's definitely a very solid sequel to smt1 and i'm glad i finished it like even though i'd say the actual experience was a little little rough <laughs> at times i definitely do sort of appreciate it for what it is but yeah at this point i'm i'm kind of starting to run out of games in the series that i had never finished like the only two games in the series that i like never finished that i probably should have are the rido games i'll probably try to finish some of those at some point but yeah, that's another game down. Hey, yo, you know who is a real baddie, though, is Madam. Damn, Madam, you fine ah hell. Man, you know who's kind of a baddie, though? Zayn. God damn, Zayn, you bad ah hell. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.